it's five past. And as we said yesterday, it's time to start. No waiting more than five minutes. I hope you're energizing, ready to start again today. Um, we, we have a, a bit of a different agenda. Uh, if you could move to the next slide, just to quickly check our agenda. And remember, we have a hashtag, MM Bridges. You can always tweet the, the suggestions that Juan shared yesterday or whatever you feel, think about the, the meeting. So today, uh, Ana Maria will give us a, an overview of the exercise of yesterday, the breakout group, and she has a little surprise for all of us. And then we will have the session C shared by Laura Gribaldo on making the most of our animal data. And finally, we will have a panel discussion after uh, the coffee break. And we hope that we will not get uh, so much delayed as yesterday. We know that we have a very important deadline today at five Portuguese time, six Itali Italian time. I will not say much, but we all know what it is. Portugal is uh, playing. <laughs> okay. And can, so I will hand it over to Ana Maria now. Ana Maria, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, um, Sophia, <clears throat> and thank you all uh, for coming back for the second day of our uh, workshop. Um, I should say maybe thank you for uh, wish, uh, being your willingness to um, play with different ways of doing things with us as in the activity of yesterday. Um, <clears throat> I have to say that it was as much uh, of a test of your um, of your being able to put up with the unpredictabilities of the online world, as I must say, many of you were thrown into um, into into groups that changed as you, you people came in and people left, and maybe you were thrown in and thrown out rather unpredictably if that's happened we're very sorry about that or other issues that may have happened just because we are still the zoom the, the zoom mode of doing um workshops is not still completely seamless shall we say um but anyway uh, also you may not necessarily have been in the uh, field of research that you most strongly identify with uh, i want to say though that despite that I'm going to just start sharing my screen now. Um, uh, despite that, you um, really um, managed heroically, and how heroically you um, you managed is uh, has been captured beautifully by our artist in resident in residence who has uh, poured over all of your work um, overnight and produced this beautiful illustration of the sheer energy and creativity that went into the discussions. Uh, one of um, our participants, as she um, reported back, said that they'd had very enthusiastic discussions. Um, and I think that it is very much shown in this uh, in this um, this cartoon of the capturing the different discussions of the different rooms, just how productive, how creative, and how indeed enthusiastic they were. So we thank you all for having having participated in that, and um, and we are really happy with the way that that it went. You know, despite I suppose the the despite, as I said, the logistical issues that we had. So um, as we go on with that, um, uh, just coming, uh, uh, um, we have listened again to the uh, breakout room, the, the plenary where everybody reported back and we ourselves poured over your notes and everything, trying to think about, you know, how we would uh, distribute these certificates that we talked about. Um, uh, that, that we said that we would give to those who managed more of the activity. I have to say, first of all, that for me personally, it was really, really gratifying to see you using the vocabulary of the activity. You embraced it, you used it, you bent it, you modified it. It was great to see it. It shows just the extent to which you are willing to take on new things and to be very agile and creative with that. So that was fantastic to see right across the board. 
It was also fantastic to see um, just what a wide range of models was compared in the, all the different groups. It was just amazing. We had models of every single kind being, being talked about, discussed and compared with each other. And I don't think that this is uh, this is very common at all to have this array of models being talked about alongside each other. And just from this, we will learn a lot. I think just you know in 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 everything that was brought forward. It was also very interesting to see that you didn't necessarily compare the obvious. Um, the, the, the 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 there were many many different kinds of comparisons across all kinds kinds of boundary lines. So we did we had comparisons across animal and non-animal models. We had comparisons of of different animal models with each other and different non-animal models with each other. We also had compa comparisons of disease models. So it was really interesting what you chose to compare and this very wide array of things that you chose chose to compare. Um, uh, and uh, so it was really, really difficult for us to think about what, you know, how, how we would, we, we would um, pick people, the groups, uh, importantly the groups, because sometimes we're not, we're not sure of who the people were, the groups that um, we wanted to give a bridging, our bridging certificates to. And so we have chosen three and, um, and but really we could have, it, it was, it, it was amazing to see how many of the groups did the work of, compa of comparison. So we've just chosen three because they were kind of different in what how, how what they achieved and what they were doing. So the first one, our first certificate, goes to oh I've got it, uh, the um, skin group. And the skin group, um, we had a report back from Ana Isabel Barbos. And um, the skin group was um, the one which got, which actually proposed a new model, uh, a new integration of the models that they started with, a new model. So they actually, they were the ones uh, who most clearly, not the only, but the ones who most clearly went to considering what would be a bridge between models. So that certificate for bridging goes to the skin group. Um, and our next um, certificate goes to the kidney group. Oh, and we should have filled in the name there. I am sorry. The, the kidney group, uh, we are inviting everybody to please fill in the, your names if you belong to that group in the chat box and we will personalize the certificates with your names on them. So the kidney um, a group, they, they um, uh, were, they um, very clearly compared um, two models of the same target going right through each of the steps and showing of, of very, very clearly of those two models of the same target, how they, they could be compared to the target and compared to each other. So that was a, a fantastic achievement. And um, lastly, but of course not leastly, <laughs> that's not even a word, but anyway, now it is, the lung group um, where I think we had the report back from Philippe and what we wanted to, uh, what how the lung, the lung group really uh, uh, stood out for us because because they compared to disease models, um, two lung disease models, and again went through the whole comparison of these two lung disease models. Um, and what we would like to say is that many, many people had very productive discussions, and we could see that, and got, you know, maybe just for a lack of time, did not get to that point. Of, of thinking about bridging. But what we do hope is that we've started out some conversations that everybody has started out some, with some conversations that possibly will go somewhere and you will be able to pick up. And our certificates are, um, are as we said, we, please put your names in the chat group so that we, we can fill in your names with each of the groups and we'll uh, then uh, distribute the certificates to you uh, digitally. So again, thank you very much, all of you. Um, it was really um, lovely to work with you on, uh, on this activity and you let us experiment with you, which was great. <laughs> um, so thank you. And we will um, now go to Laura Gribaldo, who is going to um, uh, chair the next session.
Okay, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes, I can't hear you. Okay, doesn't matter. <laughs> so welcome again to this uh, second uh, session, second uh, afternoon um, of, this, uh, of this workshop on methods and molecules in biomedical uh, sciences. Um, I think that today we are ready to listen from uh, uh, scientists working, uh, following uh, a different perspective, let's say, in respect to the ones uh, of yesterday. Um, but let me say that uh, we are here particularly uh, to open the door to the dialogue, to improve the dialogue among scientists working uh, uh, in vivo and working in vitro, because this is the specific uh, uh, scope of this, uh, of this workshop. And I hope that this will be the one of a series of workshops where this kind of dialogue uh, is improving and is uh, giving us the possibility of getting the best uh, results out of our experiments. So, to make the most of our data, both animal and in vitro data. Uh, the first speaker of today is uh, Megan Carey. Megan Carey is a group leader in the neuroscience program at the Champagne Mode Center for the Unknown in Lisbon. Megan was an international early career scientist at the Howard Hughes uh, Medical Institute and her lab is funded by the European Research Council. Her lab combined quantitative behavioral analysis, genetics, and physiology to understand how the brain controls learned and coordinated movement. She was also formerly high level policy advisor to the European Commission for Research and Innovation, Carlos Moedas. Please, Megan, the floor is yours. Um, thanks very much for the invitation to present my work to this unique audience. Um, so I understand that um, the audience here is, is rather unique and a lot of the focus in this meeting is on alternatives to the use of animal models. And for me, I'm a neuroscientist and I study the neural control of movement. And in, in my area, the, the script is a bit flipped in a way. Um, so there are robotic systems, but they are not suitable substitutes for studying biological systems for the simple reason that the robotics are still very, very, very far behind the capabilities that are inherent in biological systems for controlling movement. And just to give you an example, even with the most modern developments in artificial intelligence and robotics, we talk a lot about how computers can now beat even world experts at games like chess and Go. And that's true, but that's true in an abstract sense if they're moving the pieces around a, a virtual chessboard. And in fact, you know, if the game were to start by finding the box of uh, pieces, opening it delicately, picking out each and every piece and putting it in the right place on the uh, board without knocking any pieces over and without any prior knowledge about the shape or the size of the objects. I think you can already imagine that that's a task that would be almost impossible for robotic systems to achieve. And this is in large part, of course, our ability to do this is in large part because of the remarkable abilities of our brains to control these complex feats of coordination. And so something as, as simple as unpacking uh, chess pieces and putting them on a board, walking down the street, drinking a cup of coffee, all the way up to complex feats of gymnastic achievement. Um, these are all uh, possible without us giving them much conscious thought, but they're very, very challenging computational problems. And so my lab is interested in how the brain controls these complex coordinated and learned movements. And so we're constantly engaged in these um, very demanding tasks. And I wanna highlight that for you by pointing out that even something as simple as walking or locomotion, which is one of the areas that we study in my lab, is much more than what you think. You might think, well, I'm walking on the street, what am I doing really? I'm just putting one foot in front of the other. But even something as relatively simple as locomotion is actually quite a complex behavior. So I'll illustrate that with a little video, which I hope is playing for you. Um, this is from Kevin Perry's Instagram account, and he is illustrating uh, two, I think, of the most fascinating aspects of locomotion. One of them is that effective locomotion in a range of environments requires us to coordinate movement across many different parts of the body, 
Okay, so he's showing you lots of different possible ways of walking to achieve different goals. And this involves him coordinating differently across his, his body, his arms, his legs, and his head. Um, and then the other thing is just to point out that we are constantly making these kinds of adjustments to our walking movements based on our environmental demands. So walking is not simple alternation of the feet. It really requires complex whole body coordination and it is being continuously adapted for different environments. Uh, and if we think about the neural systems that are involved in controlling locomotion, we can see that it's actually much more um, of the brain is used for this behavior than you may have thought if you were thinking of it in a very simplistic way. And that's because we have um, circuits in the spinal cord, central pattern generators that can alternate left-right alternation of the limbs, but there's actually quite a lot of the brain that's devoted to what we call supraspinal descending control or modulation of movement that allows us to do things like coordinate in complex ways across the body. My lab is particularly interested in the cerebellum, which is an important source of modulatory signals for the neural control of movement. And it's particularly important for coordinating movement across the body and for adapting to different environments. So when we, if we want to have an animal model where we study brain mechanisms for the kinds of coordinated movement that, that I showed you in the video and that are, I should also mention, affected by many diseases that uh, impair our ability to make these kinds of coordinated movements, there are a number of model uh, systems available, particularly in, in mice, where we can um, take genetic models, for example, of different diseases and then assess their behaviors and the changes in their brains. And I started my lab now a little over 10 years ago. And at that time, the state of the art for measuring behavior in animal models, and particularly I'll talk today about mouse models, um, was there's sort of an extensive array of tools that were available, but they all shared a few different features. So you could put mice on a rod and have it accelerate and watch them try to use very complex coordinated movements to stay on these beams. You could watch them cross a balance beam. Um, you could sort of watch them by eye and rate how coordinated they were. And it's one of the limitations of these kinds of systems is that even though it might be quite a complicated task for the mouse, our readouts of those behaviors were very low dimensional. So it would be something like the number of seconds that the animal is able to stay on this rotating rod or how what percent of the time it's able to cross on a balance beam. You know, we tend to get this sort of one dimensional output of this very complex behavior. You can also measure or paw prints just by putting ink on paws or even using slightly more complex systems that can measure when the paws are touching down if you want to study um, locomotion. And these systems that were available have some advantages. So they can be pretty high throughput and they can be sensitive measures of dysfunction in various animal models, meaning your ability to detect you know, a mutant from a wild type mouse can, can be quite good. But for me as a neuroscientist, the problem was that they really lack specificity. So if a mouse falls off of a rotating rod, there can be many, many different reasons why in the underlying uh, neuropathology that wouldn't be captured by the kinds of unidimensional measurements that come out of systems like this. And so one of the first, first things that we did in my lab was to try to develop systems that were able to capture the movements of mice um, with much more resolution so that we could start to make connections between activity in the brain that we have you know, the capability of measuring with millisecond resolution from very defined subtypes. We wanted the ability to measure the behavior with that same kind of sophistication and that same kind of scale and resolution. And so uh, we developed what we call the local mouse tracking and analysis system. And it's a really pretty simple system. It's completely non-invasive and it consists of a glass corridor with a mirror underneath the corridor at a 45 degree angle so that a single high-speed camera off to the side can capture both the side and bottom views of the mouse. We do this at a high frame rate, about 400 frames per second, so we can collect continuous movies. The mouse, you see there are black boxes for the mouse to be uh, comfortable and calm on either side of this corridor. And the mouse can spontaneously decide when to cross the corridor, which triggers through via infrared beams, actually triggers the recording of the camera. Uh, so we can collect data, these videos, as the mouse is walking back and forth. So it has a few, a, a number of advantages over previously existing 
systems. Um, it's completely non-invasive, as I mentioned. It's also markerless, so there's, there's nothing, we don't have to attach anything to the mouse. And we use machine learning algorithms to identify the various features of the mouse's body, uh, so far mainly the nose, paws, and tail of the mouse. And we're able to continuously track those thanks to the two views that we get in 3D um, with, with really very high both spatial and temporal resolution. And I'll show you a movie of what this tracking looks like. Hopefully that's playing for you. Yeah. Okay. So this has obviously slowed down quite a lot. This is, this is just a, a mouse walking back and forth. You know, and again, also relatively un, unconstrained, um, freely, freely walking. And so you can see the different color coded uh, parts of the body that we've identified with our machine learning algorithm. And you could also just wanted to highlight for you that we get quite a lot of rich information out of every time that the mouse crosses the corridor. So this is just showing you for one uh, crossing of the corridor, the different color coded parts of the mouse's body. You see the nose moving forward continuously, the alternation of the four limbs, um, swinging and stancing. Here, the second graph is the vertical movements of the two front paws, and we can even track the side-to-side -side fluctuations of the tail in this setup. Now, one of the challenges, of course, is this is amazing, we get all of this data, but we have to try to make sense of it. And so one of the challenges that we face is how do we extract meaningful insights about behavior and ultimately about the brain from you know, a whole bunch of numbers like this. And you know, what, I'll just give you one sort of little example and give you a sense of the kinds of approaches that we're taking to these questions. So of course we can pick, you know, from all of that data that we get, what do we want to measure? Well, if we're interested in the neural control of locomotion, we might want to know how far the paw moves every time the mouse takes a step. And this is shown here. So this is a study we published now a few years ago. There are 10,000 strides of the mouse represented here. So, you know, I mentioned one of the advantages of the system is it's very high throughput. So um, this is you know, about a thousand times more data than um, would be typical in an experiment or, yeah, at least a hundred times more data than would be norm typical in a, in a normal experiment. And so each dot represents one stride and the animals are here, there are 34 animals here. And you can see there's quite a lot of variation in the sizes of the strides, both within mice and across mice. And in this particular case, the mice are also color coded by their weight and the stars here are the average for each individual animal. So, you know, if we want to deal with um, high quantities of data, we need to be able to deal with this kind of variation in the behavior. And so we did a few things to try to tackle that. Um, if you just replot the same data now, each dot is the same as it was on the previous slide. But as a function of the speed that the mouse is walking on any given stride, you can now see there's quite a strong relationship between walking speed and the length of the strides. And the color code, you can also see there's also a relationship between the size of the mouse. And so using this kind of approach, we're able to demonstrate that we can then use statistical modeling approaches. We use multi-level mixed effects models. And that's what's shown here in the, um, the thick lines are models that are equations that we're able to generate to predict for a given mouse of a given size walking at a particular speed exactly how big we expect those strides to be. And this kind of quantitative handle on the data is very, very useful. It allows us to make um, much more informed and uh, quantitatively precise distinctions between wild type mice and mice with various aspects of neural dysfunction. Um, because we now have statistical control, we can ask not just are they different, but are they different from what we would expect them to be since we are able to predict um, very well for typical mice how long their strides should be. And we can do this not just for stride lengths, but for many, many, many other different measures of the mouse's um, movement parameters like I was showing you. So my lab is particularly interested in the cerebellum, which controls um, coordinated movement. And so we're interested in looking at which features of cerebellar function are affected or how different models of cerebellum are differently affect behavior. And here's just, I just, I'm gonna show you some movies of a control mouse at the top. This is the cerebellum of a control mouse. These are Purkinje cells are the major neurons in the cerebellar cortex represented in red. And you can see in these two different mutants that there are missing 
Purkinje cells in this bottom mouse, so there's a Purkinje cell degeneration mouse. Realer mice in the middle here have um, very disoriented, um, um, badly placed and badly connected neurons within the cerebellar cortex. So on a neuropathological level, these two bottom mice are both mutants with strong involvement of the cerebellum, but they have specific differences in the, um, their histological profiles in the brain. And we can look at the behavior of these three different mice and compare them and contrast them quantitatively. So you can look and you can see the nice control mouse walking in a coordinated way. And I hope in this middle and bottom mouse, you can see that these mice are somehow uncoordinated. They're still crossing the corridor, but there are differences in how the different parts of their bodies are coordinated with each other in space and time. And this realer mouse is really very severely ataxic compared to the Purkinje cell degeneration mouse. When we measure different aspects of uh, function, we can see that these mice are um, walking at, at what their forward motion of individual paws is almost perfectly intact. So the controls and the mutants have almost exactly the same forward trajectory of each paw, which was actually somewhat surprising. But we can capture, this is now a video summary of the, of the vertical movements of the different parts of the mouse's body, both in control and in one of these mutants. And you can see now that even though each individual paw is moving more or less normally, there's this huge breakdown in spatiotemporal coordination across the different parts of the body. And so we're able to capture this lack of coordinated movement um, in a quantitative way with the system. We can then uh, apply measurements to many, many different features, as I mentioned, and we use something called a linear discriminant analysis where we can take, so this is about 45 different features of how the mice are walking. We can use something called linear discriminant analysis to separate um, quantitatively, identify which features are separating the mutants from the control animals, and those fall along this axis and which features are separating the two mutants from each other. And this gives us a quantitative way to identify both the shared features represented down here in these two mutants, and also the specific deficits that we see with these more specific changes in uh, how the neurons are um, uh, functioning within the cerebellum. And we're using these kinds of approaches to dissect cerebellar circuit mechanisms for locomotor coordination and learning in the cerebellum. And I'll just end by showing you that we can also now apply these same behavioral measurements with traditional measurements of neural activity. So on the left, you see a freely walking mouse that has a little micro endoscope implanted on its head. And on the right, in real time, these lines that you see are individual neurons within the cerebellar cortex. And each flash is a special kind of action potential in these Purkinje cells. And so we're now interested in trying to relate the patterns of neural activity that are occurring at the same time as this rich um, naturalistic behavior that is, of course, a behavior that's conserved um, across vertebrate species. So uh, with that, thanks again for your attention and uh, to the really talented people who did the work and to our funders. Thank you. Thank you, Megan, for the really interesting and, uh, and new for me at least uh, uh, amount of information <laughs> you gave us about uh, these uh, aspects of uh, uh, neural network uh, interested in uh, uh, locomotor uh, uh, behavior and so on. I see that there are uh, a couple of uh, questions in the chat. Uh, one is related to the gender. So if you select male and female mouse, and uh, I add if you observe any kind of uh, uh, differences in gender in terms of behavior in this uh, regard. Yeah. Uh, oops, I think I just drew on the screen. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a great question. So I, I told you that we can predict for each individual mouse walking at a certain speed and of a certain size, we can predict these different gait parameters. When we did our modeling, we actually incorporated many other things, including um, the sex of the mouse, and we did length, and we did size, we did age. Um, and what we found was that there was no additional effect of sex or age beyond the effects on body size. So um, as far as for everything that we've measured so far, when we did look at this, male and female mice were the similar to each other, but there was a difference that depended on size, um, which was related to the fact that the, the two sexes of mice can also be different sizes. Mm. But that's a great question. Yeah. Uh, and then I see another new message. 
Um, do you think that by creating a large database uh, with the local mouse tracking data, we could reduce the use of control mice? Yeah, I, I think that's also um, a great question. So, I mean, I tried to highlight the fact that by extracting so much more data from individual mice, we can we can have a, a level of sensitivity, especially for for is for situations where there might be subtle behavioral phenotypes in, in certain models, I think that can be really helpful. Whether we could decrease the use of control mice overall is a little bit tougher because um, there are also litter uh, effects that need to be looked out for. Um, so I, you know, I, I hesitate I hesitate to say that people could take our database of control data and then just compare their mutants to it. Um, but I do think overall, the number of animals that, that you need to, def to detect um, subtle phenotypes will be greatly um, reduced with this kind of attention to, to extracting as much data as possible from each animal. Okay, thank you, Megan. There are uh, a couple of other questions, but I think that we should uh, yeah. proceed with the second uh, speakers. But if you can uh, maybe reply via chat uh, to the question, it would be great. Thank I you, will. Megan, no again. Problem. Thank you. Thank you. So the next speaker will be Niccolo Bonacchi. Uh, welcome to Niccolo. I don't see him, but... Uh, he is there for sure. Uh, Nicolo is an invited professor at the Eiger Institute of Applied Psychology, where he's reading master's level courses in neurobiology and experimental programming. Uh, currently, he's working as data architect of the International Brain Laboratory, where he is the main developer of the experimental data acquisition system and procedures. Uh, within the IBL is focused on building, maintaining and defining standard for how researchers collect data and share tools. Uh, he is dedicated to using this expertise and knowledge to shape a more collaborative, equitable and open environment within the neuroscience community. Thank you, Nicolò, and please go ahead. Okay. Hi, everyone. Can you see my screen? Perfect. So thank you very much for, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you very much for the caricature. I like it very much. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to present the International Brain Laboratory. And so the, the IBL is a collaboration between several systems neuroscience lab and I've been working in for the last two and a half to three years. Uh, so similarly to what Megan did, and because of the diverse audience that we have, uh, I would like to start doing a small and probably incomplete primer of systems neuroscience. So there are many ways of studying the brain. Systems neuroscience is concerned mainly with the structure and function of neural circuits and systems, uh, particularly in how they relate to behavior. So there are many flavors of systems neuroscience labs. There are some are focused on sensory system. We just saw a very good example of a lab focused on motor systems. You have labs focused on spatial navigation, decision-making, learning and memory, and so on. So by systems, systems neuroscience, in systems neuroscience, we mean uh, just a functional unit that participates in a particular behavior. And this can be localized in a particular brain region, or it can be distributed all across the brain. So, to, to the extent of such a thing actually existing, a canonical systems neuroscience lab uh, is usually focused on one system, occasionally more than one, and uses a variety of techniques to define and describe the particular system of interest. Uh, usually there is a fair degree of, of optimization of an experiment uh, in order to maximize the engagement of whatever system that, that you're studying, <clears throat> especially given the technique that is being used. On the, uh, on the other hand, collaborations between labs and systems neuroscience are mainly of two types. Uh, we find small groups of labs, both theoretical and experimental, that might collaborate on specific projects using the same model uh, of the single lab that I just explained, or big, big institutions like notably the Allen Brain Institute in Seattle that defines flagship institutional goals which are managed under the same organizational structure. Uh, finally, and it's because more linked to, to my actual area of, of work right now is data sharing. Uh, Although it's although recently, well, with technological advances, it has become easier to collect big amounts of data, even for a single lab. 
designing and executing an experiment, like for example, the one that you saw right now uh, from scratch is a really big investment for a, for a lab. And consequently, what usually happens is the scientists are hesitant to share data, even if the data has been published. With high throughput data, you, you, you cannot possibly analyze everything that you can in one paper. So the data itself begs for a second and, and also a third pass data sometimes, a third pass analysis sometimes. Uh, so what happens is that uh, usually data is stored in metaphorical drawers. And until someone finds that in the lab finds a new student or postdoc that is willing to, to work on the on the data sets. Furthermore, as we've been experiencing more, well, we've been noticing more and more, the descriptions of materials and methods that are published in our papers are increasingly insufficient to reproduce the, our experiments. So even in the rare cases where there is an incentive to actually do a replication study, if something doesn't work, the researcher itself is left with two options. They contact the author and wait for a response that might never arrive. Or usually what they do is they solve the problem themselves and basically they reinvent the wheel and re-implement the experiment in their own way. So we end up having multiple ways of doing the same thing that appear equivalent, but might not be. Okay, so this was a small introduction <laughs> and probably biased introduction. Uh, and so right now I'd like to present the collaboration where I've been working on <clears throat> and how we achieve reproducibility and data reuse. I'm going to briefly explain our data architecture and the standardization efforts that we made for uh, on our experimental procedures and also how we promote our internal collaborations. So the IBL is in the middle of the two kind of collaborations that I was presenting earlier. We are a mesoscale or mid-sized collaboration. At the moment, we're 22 labs, uh, 11 experimental labs and 11 theoretical labs located both in Europe and the US. And we basically want to tackle the questions that are too big for one single lab to address in a decentralized and open way. So our, our main goal or our stated goal is to develop the first brain-wide neural on one simple behavior uh, and recording from all over the brain. This, this is what we call the brain-wide map. So all steps of the projects are shared between the labs. And most importantly, the data collection step is divided between uh, our 11 experimental labs. So all of these labs are effectively running the same experiment and contributing data to the same big data set. In order for our experiments to be reproducible across all the contingencies of countries and institutions, there was a considerable amount of time and effort that's, well, that was spent in, in the, the two main areas I'm presenting next, the building the data infrastructure and standardizing our procedures. So in terms of, of data architecture, this is a figure from uh, from our bioarchive paper, which is currently under submission. And this is a figure that details the life cycle of our data from the rig up to the, the user or the person that is analyzing. <clears throat> our efforts in this sense, in, in, in terms of data architecture, consisted in developing both the infrastructure and a data model that solves the problem of this asynchronous acquisition of, of data from multiple locations, because we have labs in multiple different time zones. Uh, and also solving the problem of having fast and easy search and download of the data from anywhere in the world. So these are kind of the principles that we try to work through and our data uh, is uh, automatically shared within the collaboration and immediately shared. Our immediate means within 24 hours because we have a bunch of pre-processing and quality control uh, that we run on the data. Uh, we're using importantly an electronic laboratory notebook or our meta database that stores all of the acquisition metadata automatically, but also allows manual input from, from, from our researchers. And this allows anyone to be able to search or filter data sets and sessions according to whatever desired criteria, criteria they want, uh, independently of the data, so separated from the data. You don't need to have the data to know what you have uh, collected already. Uh, our data is stored all in the same place in a central data server or at the San Diego supercomputing facility. And our data model, as I was saying, allows us to, to, to download the data, only the data that you need without having to download extreme amount of data or large amount of data in order to run a simple analysis. Uh, our pre-processing and quality controls are also automated. And if, if you really want uh, more details about this, uh, please go read the, the, our bioarchive paper if, if you are interested about these things. Uh, 
Okay, so the important thing that we discovered is that, that it's, it's important for people to be able to reproduce their analysis uh, that they talk the same language. So we developed an API, which is computer scientist for application programmer interface. So it means that the way we talk to the data and we ask questions to our meta database, it's all the same. And this makes it easy for people to actually share analysis code and uh, reproduce results uh, of analysis amongst each other. Uh, besides that, we also developed a lot of visualization tools for looking at our data from uh, and step in our pipeline. Uh, and all of our code is open and under Interbrain Lab on GitHub and share everything under an MIT license. Okay, so that was our data architecture in terms of our experimental procedures. So the experiment that is running in all the labs. The first thing that we did uh, was to actually clearly define an experimental setup and task. So this you can see is a, a 3D model of our uh, rig that has uh, multiple uh, sensors and uh, devices that acquire uh, a lot of data. Uh, and we have extensive parts lists and manuals on, on both our hardware and our software to how to assemble and install uh, the stuff. And this is, is essential for us because we need to be able to reproduce the exact same condition in a different location, but it's certainly not perfect. So it's, it's always being updated. Uh, but at least in comparison to methods in, in papers that you might randomly find in a paper, we tested it several times and we, we're confident that this set works. So our task is moderately simple, as you can see in the in the image on the right. So it involves a mouse uh, being presented uh, with the visual sensory stimulus of different contrasts on the screen, and the mouse has to report if the if the stimulus that he was presented was on the right or on the left using a, a wheel. Uh, besides the task and the setup, another important source of variability uh, that we tried to minimize was the training. If you ever trained an animal, uh, if you did any, ever did a behavioral experiment, the training is always uh, the, the magical part of how to get an animal to, to learn the behavior. So the way we try to minimize variability for uh, comparison between, between the, the different labs was actually automating all of the training. And in this figure, you see an example of uh, an animal during uh, the progression of sessions. Uh, and the introduction of different contrasts according to not only the animal's performance, but also uh, other uh, behavioral variables that we measure. Besides the training, the, we, we went to a huge effort of standardizing our surgical procedure, our housing procedure uh, and handling protocols. And we also standardize all our policies that respect all, all of animal welfare and local policies, not only of the institution, but also of the different countries. Uh, involved in the in the collaboration. So finally, of course, if the if the if the data that we collect has to be then comparable, and which means which means that if I look at the data, we should not uh, anyone should not be able to actually guess uh, what lab the data was coming from. There should be more or less uh, the the variability of the data should be more or less homogeneous, and we can see this in the first plots. As a, as a psychometric function where I'm plotting the reports of the animal that's, that says that the stimulus was on the right as a function of the stimulus actually being on the left, on the right, and of the different contrast levels. And all the different colors are actually the different labs, and they nicely overlap. Uh, slightly more formally, in the second plot, we're actually, we actually use uh, uh, several different decoding uh, models, and we ask the model uh, to tell us which lab the animal comes from, just feeding it all of our behavioral data. And as you can see in the, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but as you can see the, the, the decoder, we, we tried the several different decoders, but all our decoders cannot uh, detect where the, where the data is coming from uh, when compared to a shuffle or the theoretical chance level. But importantly, if we now feed it the, the, the time zone where the, where of the data, then it can, uh, it can tell us, okay, this, this data came from this lab. Uh, so as I was saying, we here are uh, all the links. We recently published this in, in eLife, and this we're very happy about this because it's our first kind of platform paper as a collaboration. And uh, all of the extensive appendices of uh, how to build and how to set up the task and everything are also shared 
<clears throat> on Figshare. All of our data is on that link, and please feel free to uh, to visit the websites and download the data yourself and look at it yourself. So this was actually the first step for reaching our goal of doing this brain-wide map, and we are right now at around 70% of completion, more or less, of our uh, of the collection of our electrophysiological data. And at the same time, as we're completing this, we're actually defining and formalizing uh, all of our quality control criteria and metrics, uh, similarly to what we just did with the behavior. Okay, so last topic, which is how do we promote collaboration within the IBL? So we have several ways of promoting it, and I will just mention one because I particularly like this one. And so uh, as a collaboration, we have one main goal <clears throat> that is being uh, iterated upon, but researchers that come through the IBL have their own personal projects. And it, this came as a need of fomenting collaboration, but also as a need to, because we are so distributed, to understand what was going on and maybe uh, keeping track of uh, whatever one might call it a scientific zeitgeist. Uh, we basically created a project registration step where both PhD students and postdocs can actually register or declare their, to the rest of the IBL what they're working on. It's a kind of a declaration of intent. So this is a screen grab from the website that we use for registering these projects. We use GitHub, and this is the only repository in GitHub in our organization, which is private. Uh, and you can see three different categories of projects. You can see ideas in blue, uh, proposals or pilots in yellow, and the proper projects in green. The difference between the three is very simple. A project idea has an author and a timestamp, but does not mean that the author of the idea wants or will work on it. It's, it's literally a dump of consciousness and ideas that our researchers are having and that we hope can spark conversations. Uh, a pilot uh, in yellow or a project proposal is, is, is a tentative project. So there is an idea already, there is the authors already have invested some time and resources. Uh, the hypothesis might not be fully operationalized, uh, but it's on its way of becoming a full project. And the project itself in green uh, are really a more formal entry to where, which are expected to result in uh, a publication. And uh, it has a time frame which is much shorter than the, the IBL platform kind of goals. Uh, it has a supervisory board and a, a list of collaborators and resources from the collaboration that are required. So basically upon joining the IBL, a, research can, a researcher, whatever the level, can just use this resource not only to find good ideas that someone had at some point that would be a, something good that we can work on, uh, but also to see uh, more or less in real time what people are, uh, are already doing. So instead of working by themselves and reinventing the wheel, they now have a choice to maybe join a, a pilot or a project that are interested and contribute to it. So besides this, we already, we of course use uh, a lot of uh, other tools, especially computational or uh, informatics tools like Slack and GitHub, Zoom. Uh, in a way, we kind of were prepared for the pandemic. We were very used to having, it's our main communication platform is Zoom, uh, except for the fact that then labs started closing all over the world in, in differential manner. Uh, and we have a set of policies <clears throat> that also help or, or we think help and try to organize uh, how we do collaboration within the IBL. In fact, if you go to our uh, Google Scholar, so the IBL has a, a Google Scholar page and there is already a list of uh, something like a dozen publications that come from exactly these personal collaborations. Uh, and they are on several topics, some very specific scientific topics. There is a notable paper from Lauren Wool about actually our organizational structures and how we make decisions, which is, has been published in from I'm not sure the, the journal, so I won't say it. Uh, and OK, so I'm over time. So what I presented to you is the IBL as a mesoscale <clears throat> a distributed collaboration or decentralized collaboration. Uh, and we have uh, clearly defined scientific goals. I've shown you, hopefully, how our efforts in standardizing our methods and protocols we're working and how our common data architecture and computational pipeline implements data sharing. Uh, finally, I've shown you how one of the ways that we're promoting internal collaboration, and I hope I made the case for actually working in the open and how uh, open science and open data are essential to promote reproducibility and also data reuse. Okay. 
So thank I'd you. like to just, if you like, just let me thank uh, everyone at the IBL, and this is my welcome slide, and especially our funders, the Welcome Trust and the Simon Foundation, and especially the, the San Diego Supercomputing Facility of the Flatiron Institute. That's where all our data is stored. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh... Thank you, Dr. Bonacchi. Um, I, I would uh, make a, questions, uh, a question. Um, which are the major uh, limitations you see? Um, which are the, 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 the worst uh, or, or, or the major sources of, uh, of uh, uh, as I can say, of difficulties in extrapolating data from animal to humans uh, in your approach? Where do you see that uh, there is a lack of uh, knowledge that you can't uh, fill uh, with this approach? So I'm not sure I, I understand the question. So what are the limitations in extrapolating data from mouse behavior to human behavior? In this, yes, in this approach that you use, uh, which are the sources of... Uh, uh major uh yes challenges or limitations so the there are various so as actually we were one of the discussions that we were having yesterday in the brain group is we use uh mouse the mouse's brain and mouse behavior as a proxy for human brain and behavior to the extent that we are uh, at least uh, in, 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 in systems neuroscience, we are interested in mechanism of how the brain implements uh, specific cognitive functions that are required for a particular behavior. So defining the behavior is very important. Measuring the behavior, as you saw also in Megan's talk, is very important. Uh, and accurately having enough dimensions to kind of find sources of variability. Uh, the extrapolation to humans then is, I, I don't think we're there yet as a community. <laughs> I don't think we can actually directly extrapolate, although uh, there is a lot of indicators that uh, these extrapolations are possible. Indeed, that's why we use uh, mouse models. So the development of the brain is, is, is similar. We have some difference, so we don't have, we don't have sulci in, in, in mouse brains. It's mostly flat, but uh, the structures are the same. Uh, and uh, the complexity of behavior is much higher and as, as I come from psychology. <laughs> so I, I did my psychobiology as a master's in the neuroscience. And I was uh, convinced that the humans were the, the most complex produ producers of behavior that we have. And if we really think about even a single a simple behavior, uh, the amount of computation that has to be implemented in a brain is, is, is it's very high and animals do this seamlessly and in some sense more honestly than humans. With humans, we usually re rely on uh, reports and questionnaires, which is a behavior in itself. So it's a reflection on what you did. With animals, because we don't have language, we actually have to measure it. We have to measure physiological measurements and behavioral measurements. And in that sense is more directly related to uh, the mechanism and how the brain actually implements these behaviors. So I don't, I'm not sure if I answered your questions, but- Yes, uh, yes. No, no, it's interesting this last, this uh, observation that you comment you did uh, on language is extremely interesting to me. So this is the, one of the big, uh, biggest differences, no? Among uh, our species and the other species, language. So, and the, and the impact of language in this, uh, uh, circuits of behavior, uh, it, it has to be extremely uh, important, extremely, you know, uh, heavy. Okay. Thank you so much. So uh, I think uh, we can move to the next uh, speaker, Brigitte Landesman, our dear colleague, <laughs> Brigitte. Brigitte is a medical doctor and uh, she has worked for many years in clinical medicine. Uh, then she joined the European Commission Joint Research Center in ISPRA in 2002. At the Chemical Safety and Alternative Methods Units, she dealt with alternative approaches to animal-based tests in chemical risk assessment and got mainly involved in the generation, dissemination, and application of adverse outcome pathway knowledge. As active senior, she's still involved in the OECD AOP development program and Jersey project. So thank you, Brigitte, and please. 
floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Laura. Thank you, everyone. And also thank you for this nice slide. I wonder whether we can have it afterwards because it's the nicest slide I ever saw at any uh, presentation. Okay, so I'll share my screen. And, uh, okay. So, speaking about bridges, about AOPs, or bridges, and there's hardly anything that can represent bridges better than AOPs do. Because AOPs do not only bridge between the different levels of biological organization, they also bridge between knowledge silos, between people, between methods, and also between animals, what regards biological pathways. And I will try to tell you, show you why. Because AOPs, uh, they don't uh, produce new data, but they want to make use of all these many data that we have, that we already have uh, there. They categorize and uh, organize all this different data. Because what we want to know is after um, an initial injury on molecular level, how does this injury propagate through the all the levels of biological organization up to an adversity? And for better understanding this, we use a whole lot of different methods, disciplines, data information from these disciplines and methods. And we as said we don't produce new ones, but we uh, put them together and put them in context. And just by doing this, we get more information, more knowledge, more understanding. And not only more understanding of how an adversity or a disease develops, also understanding what we are missing. Where are the knowledge gaps? Where do we need to uh, focus our future research? So AOPs also, give us a basis for um, building integrated testing strategies. They help us to identify biomarkers and they also drive the development of new assays and new methods wherever necessary. Of course, behind this uh, different data are people. And as you can see, there is a wide diversity of different experts and specialities that are stakeholders that can, can contribute to this common knowledge. All of them are experts. Uh, they have a profound knowledge of a specific area. And very often they work on the same issues, the same topics, but they work in parallel and there is no or not sufficient exchange. And AOPs are an excellent platform for providing this interaction and exchange. They build up trustworthy, this, uh, trustworthy data in a transparent way. And uh, they are, of course, these experts, they come from industry and academia. And they also provide um, information on, for regulators and risk assessors. And not only that they take out their knowledge, their information, they also can give their input so that it's a common construction of something that's useful for everybody. So to say what kind of data they need. So it's a give and a take. Everybody gives in knowledge or their information, their data and takes out again, more knowledge and the wide prospect. And the SAOPs also provide, a, a com they can communicate complex biology in a understandable way. They are also useful for politicians for their decision making and also for NGOs and civil society. So actually virtually for everyone. So this is a general about AOPs. Um, um, yeah, and I'll give you an example and maybe you have seen it again. So just about this uh, where things come together. It's the AOP to liver fibrosis that was built uh, upon an um, exposure to a chemical toxicology. Then uh, later on, uh, we've seen that um, exposure to nanoparticles, they have a different entry point, but they end up in the same pathway. And going further in medicine, virus, it's not, it's the hepatitis C virus, which is the most common cause for liver fibrosis, again, has another start, but um, 
comes again, merges with this main OVP and even low dose radiation as we have found out is uh, following the same pathway. There might be more, it's not that we just haven't explored it yet. So it's always uh, um, the same pathway, it's, it's the pathway to disease and we combine those different studies beginning end in the middle to build it. And the nice thing about it that we can add to what's already there. We don't have to invent the wheel over and over again. We take what's there, we use what's there, we add and we increase continuously this information and have all the our resources to build the new things and and not to 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 start over and over again. And as I uh, hope or presume that you already are knowledgeable. I want to give you a very short overview of the main the essential um, features of the EOP framework. As said before, we want to understand how an injury on molecular level uh, propagates and ends up at an adversity. And um, this uh, interaction always independently of the stressor always is on the molecular level. And here the stressor does the injury. And it is not important what kind of stressor. It's important that the stressor is able to harm uh, in a sufficient long and severe manner to start the pathway. So it's the trigger. And upon that, the stressor doesn't play any role anymore. It's just about biology and pathophysiology. So the stressor goes away. But what it is important, I hope it's not because I've heard this strange thing here. So AOPs are modular, meaning that they are um, con they consist of building blocks and these building blocks can be reused in any way. So they can be taken and put in other AOPs, could be expanded, explored, shared, borrowed. So um, this is the basic principle of it. And these building blocks, they are the key events. You can see them here, they are all key events. And just uh, the starting and the final point, they are differently named. It's the molecular initiative event and adverse outcome. But in other pathways, they might be ordinary middle key events. And combining those key events are the key event relationships. Looking a bit closer at these uh, building blocks, these are the key events. So which are kind of signposts along the pathway ideally one on each of the levels, and uh, they show us where we are. So for identifying them, we, they need to be measurable, and they also need to be essential, otherwise they wouldn't be signposts. So they have to be there, uh, but they're not sufficient, not necessarily. But if they are not there, we can say that we are not following this specific pathway. So we describe these key events, and it's important to describe them in a generic way, otherwise they won't be uh, interusable. So the, for instance, cell death, yeah, that you describe it, that the process, process is there, and this will be valid for any tissue, any organ again, and you just take this module and put it somewhere else where you need it. Then we describe the models, methods for observing them and the taxonomic applicability. And the key event relationship, the second um, um, model or building block, uh, combines these uh, key events by making a directed relationship, an early and a late one. And the state of the early key event let us infer the state of the uh, late key event. And this is really uh, very, very important to describe this in a, in a very sufficient way. And there are some parts which are um, asked to describe it's the biological plausibility, empirical support, because these make part together with the essentiality of the key events uh, of the weight of evidence uh, assessment, not only for the key event relationships, but for the whole AOP. And here we can, when we stay so as generic as possible, the key event description, here we can put more details. So we can say what's the difference between species, between sexes or age. So there is the more context specific um, uh, description. And here we also have the quantitative understanding. So we speak about time uh, uh, delay, about feedback, fit forward mechanisms, modulating factors, and the response response relationships where we describe the kind of curve that relates to biological processes. And all this is also the basis for modeling of 
uh, uh, the put for being able to predict that worse it is based from early key events. Individual AOPs, by definition, are a single sequence of key events starting from a specific MIE going to a specific adversity without taking branches in consideration. This might be a bit simplistic, but it is a, a, it's a pragmatic simplification to, to handle a very complex problem. And it might be seen in analogy to, to roadmaps. If you want to go from one point to the other, I decide on a street and I follow the street and I won't go all the sideways and explore all the possible other ways. I go one way. I might go another way and the next time and another way and another way. The same way we explore different pathways of, a, of, of uh, one uh, uh, process and overlaying them, we come up to networks. And these networks, uh, it's where um, AOPs meet systems biology. And AOP network and AOP network is um, are at least two AOPs that share at least one key event, and they are actually those that we can use for application AOPs. So if one AOP, another one, we share they share a key event, they share maybe probably also key event relationships. So we don't have to put two; we can put just one and have them um, combine them. So we add this part that's missing and we have uh, already a network. We can add another branch now that we, we, we have the main structure that maybe lead to different species. So we just already see the common uh, origin. And uh, you can see that from having two AOPs by adding not so much more um, information, but dot, we get up with a network with four AOPs. So it's a good uh, um, uh, return on investment uh, that we get out more than we give in if we build on what's there. And uh, also, they help us to understand combined effects and even generate no new knowledge, as said before, by just adding things together. So if we have two stressors that act on the same MIE, we can understand how these different stressors act together and uh, have an impact on the adversity. And there might also be the case, but there are the cases that different stressors, different MIs, different pathways, they sooner or later merge. So we can see how different key events act together upon one certain adversity. And even we can reveal how different pathways are interlinked, something that has not been known before. And uh, developing and depicting AOPs allows us to get this insight. And again, you might have seen this slide before, but it is so impressing. It's the uh, AOP network for thyroid axis disruption during development. Um, as you can see, several MIEs, several pathways that at some point converge, then diverge again. And here for the uh, adversity, we see that they end up in different uh, species. It's mammals and humans, amphibia and fish. And this uh, beautiful thing shows us with one just one view how things are interlinking. And again, these are not uh, made by themselves. They are made by different people, different uh, uh, disciplines, different uh, information data put together. So just by putting them together, our inside our knowledge, our understanding is increased. Um, another important um, uh, feature is that they are living documents. There's nothing like a final AOP because knowledge is increasing always. So we have a hypothesis, we add data, qualitative, quantitative ones, and it's uh, as much data we add, the more confidence we get, the less uncertainty, but also the more time and more money. But all this is feeding back. So it's really living in itself because uh, also AOPs, they trigger new knowledge because they show the gaps and this also feeds back. So it's always continuing and there is nothing. I mean, there's also, it's useful, everything. It's just putting this knowledge together. Everything is useful. It's just what we don't want to use it for. So they need to be fit for purpose, but use, always useful. And the platform for doing all this is the AOP Wiki. 
And um, according to this modularity, there is uh, this is, uh, system is maintained. So we have AOP pages, key event pages, key event relationship pages. And these pages can be taken and put wherever you need them. You just take them and add in somewhere and they are interlinked. So you are invited to, to have a look at the AOP. So what can we do there? We can view just doing nothing, just entering the the, um, AOP, the um, website and you can view it, you can print it. If you want to comment, you're very well uh, welcome. So you need to uh, make an account to sign up. It's very easy, uh, very fast, no approval. And on every site, every page of this wiki, there is a discussed page. And you are really, uh, if you know something more, better, you think something is wrong, just discuss, get in, get in contact with the author. So this is the idea, idea of crowdsourcing, of getting knowledge together and combining on one page. If you want to develop, then you have to uh, sign up. Uh, sign in. So you ask for a um, writer request, which you do by writing a mail on the Society for the Advancement of AOPs. This is also very fast. It's just to know who is there, who you are, who want to develop and you contribute. Then you can edit any page. And last page is to can review. So this is my last slide. I invite you to to see, come to the to the common website and 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 contribute to this common knowledge. And I thank you for your attention. And um, yeah, happy to answer any slides if there are. Thank you, thank you, Brigitte. Uh, I am looking at the chat, but. Uh, let me see, because maybe I don't see all the questions. Uh, oh yeah, I see. One question is, uh, how do you create a key event when there is contradictory data in, for example, cellular responses to a drug? Um, yeah, but this is one of the points there that, that, that we often face that we have uh, contradictory data. So there is uh, a need for more clarification. This is something that you, uh, can then describe and you can't, uh, you can't really build the key event as long as you are not clear about it. And that is also what AOPs um, um, confront us with our lack of knowledge and our lack of understanding. You can outline there and show this, um, depending on the source, that you have reliable sources and that you uh, show this, demonstrate it and ask for input and for the research to clarify these points. That's, that's one of the ideas behind. Okay. Uh, another question is how AOP can be made more human relevant? Uh, I suppose the question is uh, uh, which are the, the best data to be included in an AOP to make the AOP close to the human uh, that's yeah. that's actually what we also uh, aim to to use uh, human relevant data and use human relevant models. Of course, we use any any models that we have and any data that we have, but we are aiming for uh, if we. I mean, there is also eco toxicological outcomes, so then we have to be. Uh, we don't need the human data, but if we want to to understand and uh, predict uh, human outcomes, of course, we aim for human relevant data. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Brigitte. I think yeah. that uh, if there are no more questions, we can uh, move to the last uh, speakers of today. Um, I want to, to introduce Laura Elix Clairbeau. Uh, welcome, Laura Elix. Uh, she studied bioengineering and chemistry. Uh, at the University of Louvain in Belgium. And uh, for more than 10 years, she was investigating molecular <clears throat> and um, molecular and cellular mechanism leading to liver and intestinal diseases using various in vitro uh, and in vivo methods and models. In 2015 at the GRC, uh, she explored how to integrate in silico and in vitro data related to membrane transporter in chemical risk assessment. And currently she is working uh, um, again at the Joint Research Center of the Commission as co-responsible for running the CHOW project, which aims at modeling the COVID-19 pathogenesis via the adverse outcome pathway framework. So please, Laura Lix. Thank you, Laura. 
nice introduction and the nice drawing. So I will share my screen. Okay. Could you see my screen? Yes. Thank you. So thank you for the, for the nice introduction and thank you for the invitation to this really uh, interesting uh, workshop. So today it's my pleasure to present the CHOW project. So the CHOW project aims at, at providing an overview of the COVID-19 biological mechanism using the adverse outcome pathway framework uh, Bridget just told you about. So we believe that by building networks together, we will better understand the disease. And, and regarding the title of the workshop, uh, bridges or networks, they, they both aim at increasing interconnection between the science, between the models, between the, the person. So um, everyone knows that COVID-19 is a global health emergency. So researchers around the world is mobilized uh, to investigate the biological mechanism underpinning the disease. But this global uh, mobilization uh, resulted in a tsunami of a publication of biological data on COVID-19. So how many COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 related publication uh, do you think were recorded for the year 2020 in PubMed? approximately? If, if you think of a number in your head, just to have a range of an ID. Actually, if you type those two keywords, it's more than 120,000 publication that have been recorded uh, for this year 2020. And of course, this amount is continuously increasing and at a fast speed. So public decision makers, but scientists and clinicians as well are a bit overloaded with the uh, information. So the CHOW project aims to make sense or to consolidate or to organize this enormous amount of biological information regarding COVID-19 using the adverse outcome pathways, AOP. So as Brigitte mentioned, AOP do not necessarily produce new knowledge, but based on all this published work, it will organize and provide an overview of the COVID-19 process for the initial molecular interaction, which is here, of course, the binding of the virus to a specific receptor in particular cells. And it will describe this, this first initiating event uh, through essential biological key even in the cells, tissue, organs, leading to an adverse outcome. So here it's exemplify uh, the lung damage leading to respiratory distress, which is the most well-known symptoms in COVID-19 patients. But the disease, it's, it's really complex. Uh, all the organ can be infected by SARS-CoV-2. I bet you heard about all these different clinical symptoms that are now observing patients. And if we think about there is the lung for sure, we heard about also the brain with the loss of smell in the long term, the heart failure, the kidney injury, the gastrointestinal disorder, liver, and even more recently, pancreas. So buildings AOP, that will depict the different outcome of COVID-19 that we can observe in patients relies on the knowledge community. It relies on interdisciplinary collaborative efforts, synergizing the exchange uh, between experts from different fields like virologists, biologists, neurologists, clinicians, and so on. So the project started during the summer uh, last year. It's an ongoing process. Uh, but for the moment, currently more than 65 scientists uh, from 40 different organizations around the world are participating in the project. And there are still space for anyone who want to join. So development of COVID-19 AOPs um, include implementation of previous knowledge, especially uh, notably on inflammation. Indeed, inflammation is an important biological process involving COVID-19. And in 2017, a workshop was organized gathering experts uh, around the thematic of inflammation to discuss and agree on the representation of the inflammatory process within AOP. So three key events were proposed as uh, all marks of uh, the inflammation, independent of tissue, and that can be independently measured, as Brigitte mentioned, and that are essential for inflammation. So three key events, which are tissue resident cell activation, increased pro-inflammatory mediator, and leukocyte recruitment or activation, uh, were proposed to be used as up key event in the AOP where inflammation is described. So those three key events uh, were integrated within the AOPs describing uh, here, for example, it's putative AOP describing pulmonary outcome of COVID-19. 
And you can already find all of this given and all of this AOP that have been developed within the project on the AOP wiki that Brigitte told you about. As she mentioned, you can already read them, they are public, and you can already comment them, and you can even participate in the development, in the further development of these AOPs. So individual AOP are linear from a specific molecular initiating event, which is here the binding of the virus to the receptor up to a specific adverse outcome. It could be either lung injury or respiratory distress. But as Brigitte mentioned, the modular aspect of the AOPs allows for the development of AOP networks. And, and within those AOP networks, shared key events become evident. And this is particularly interesting also for COVID-19 as the clinical outcome seems are various and they seem disparate. But the interconnected key event or the shared key event within different AOPs might identify central biological mechanism. And here's the case, for example, in the COVID-19 with the coagulopathy or thrombosis, uh, as well as with systemic inflammation that are uh, common to lung injury and respiratory distress adverse outcome, but have been also identified in AOP describing kidney injury uh, as well in uh, liver injury. In the case of COVID-19 also, it's a bit different from the other AOP network is that the molecular initiating events are obviously the same. And so we will build on that uh, using those molecular initiating events to reuse the knowledge from uh, the people who work on that for the, the other adverse outcome in the different uh, organs. So buildings AOP network will help to provide an overview of the disease process while reusing the knowledge. And this is possible thanks also to a network of scientists that are working together to cure the information, to cure all the publication, the biological data available uh, to build these uh, networks. So each scientist with its own expertise. Others are just some faces, some faces uh, of the child volunteer, the child crowd, but not all of them at all, because as I mentioned, the virus can infect also the gut, the heart, the brain, and so AOP are being developed regarding uh, neurological symptoms, cardiovascular issues, or uh, gastrointestinal disorders. Furthermore, such mechanistic understanding of the disease via the AOP helps to capture the various factors that are influencing uh, the outcomes and uh, the clinical outcomes. Biological factors such as age, sex, microbiota, lipid, and so on. And sex and age uh, were actually presented by uh, Lucia Gabrielli uh, yesterday as influencing the human system. So other experts are also working here on identifying or integrating those biological factors uh, to the AOPs. Uh, depicting COVID-19. Another group also aims to elucidate the multi-scale factor of COVID-19. So beyond purely biology, such as uh, psychological stress, lifestyle, relation with other animals, uh, they try also to integrate this multi-scale, uh, different scale and different levels of time as well into the AOP of COVID-19. The end user of COVID-19's AOPs are equally interdisciplinary as the developer. Due to the principle of the AOP framework, uh, Brigitte just told you about. So they are stressor as specific, they are modular. They are pragmatic sequence of, they are finally abstracts of detailed research. They also allow interconnection between unrelated disease, but the share similar key even or share similar adverse outcome. And as you mentioned, they are living document in the sense that they can be constantly updated. So AOP can be updating with the increasing understanding we have of the human biology. So at the, at the smaller level of this description for the uh, molecular or cellular response, the mechanistic data, the omics, the biomarker could be inputs for pharmacologists to uh, highlight the potential repurposing of existing drugs like infection blockers, overreaction inhibitor, tissue injury interceptor. At a higher level, that, at the tissue response, organism response, or population level, the clinical, epidemiological, or field study data could be input for clinicians to highlight or to better identify 
diagnostic markers, and also to better understand the individual outcomes of the patient. But actually, those COVID-19 SOP could be also input for toxicologists. So for toxicology, building on the unique opportunity provided by uh, COVID-19 um, to understand human biology based on the enormous amount of data arising from the crisis. So the COVID-19, if we use the knowledge from the toxicology to better understand uh, the process, but on the other way around, those AOP that, can, that have been developed could reinforce our understanding of the human biology for toxicology. So we believe or we hope <laughs> that AOPs for COVID-19 uh, allows to synergize expertise from various communities along the AOP, that they can um, allow or leverage the reuse of prior knowledge from toxicology and medicine to better understand this uh, uh, knowledge. They also, AOPs for COVID-19 also helps in the identification of knowledge gaps to really point out where additional research is needed uh, know to better understand the disease or where we should focus on the research. It provides also a better understanding of the modulating factor that are influencing the severity and the progression of the disease. It can also alight the potential repurposing of existing drugs, as I mentioned, because it's based on mechanistic understanding of unrelated disease for which already uh, drugs exist. It can add a better understanding of the interrelation between various outcomes by building all these uh, networks. It can help in the detection of new biomarker of the disease onset or the disease progression. The mechanistic understanding that we see also seen a driver for fear driving data generation. And from a modeling perspective, structuring the knowledge is of course really informative to develop computational models. So before the acknowledgement slide, I would like to take the opportunity to invite you all to visit our website, which is chao slash covid.net, where the project is uh, described, as well as the different data and output of the workshop, as well as the publication that have been already released uh, with all the work sourced by the Chao project. Also, there is a link to the AOP wiki and to the AOP that have been developed already uh, within the project. So again, as Brigitte mentioned, for the AOP wiki, you can have a look, you can read, you can comment, or you can contribute. Indeed, we are still um, filling the holes in our COVID-19 uh, knowledge wall. And so if you are working in a hospital, in labs, behind a computer, whatever you are, junior or senior, we have a child junior collaborator. If you have one hour, one day, regular time to offer, please don't hesitate uh, to join us if you think your expertise uh, could be helpful. There are different ways to participate into the project. So you can be part of a working group. You can provide sporadically ad hoc expertise. You can participate in the child workshops, collaborate for the literature search, work into the AOP wiki, or become co-author of child publication. So if you're interested, don't hesitate to visit the website or to contact me uh, directly. Thank you very much for your attention and thank you to all the Chao collaborators so far. Thank you, Laura Lix, for the presentation. Extremely interesting, uh, um, especially because we are, of course, clearly touched everybody by this uh, big pandemic. And, um, and there is a a question from Joao, a very general question on uh, how did you motivate the people to join uh, and collaborate uh, in this case? Uh, so, um, a part of the um, of the of the COVID, uh, of course, uh, seriousness of the of the COVID disease. Uh, but uh, yeah, how, how did you motivate the people? And the second question is, how do you organize all the information you collect? Do you use any software, just reading? So technically speaking, how do you organize uh, the, the knowledge content? Oh, thank you for the question. So for the first one, how do we motivate people to join? So uh, it's indeed a crowdsourcing effort. So it's based on uh, voluntary 
uh, participation. But as you mentioned, the first point is really a common goal. We all aim to better understand and better fight uh, the COVID-19. And it's clear by the amount of publication and by the complexity of the disease that it's not the job of one expert. So we have to be together. And that I think is the first motivation of the people who join. And then also definitely we are all scientists, so we need a publication or credits. And so we, we have publications that are released uh, about what is sourced by the Chao project. So um, the, I think those two um, are, are the main point. And also we, you can do networking. So we are really uh, a crowd of different experts. So already by gathering together, that by having this ecosystem where all the, the specialist uh, scientists from different fields can really discuss together, it's already for, for, for a lot of them, it's already increased the network outside the field of discipline, outside the network they used to, to be. And uh, the second question was on the organization of uh, the uh, information content. So if you use a software, if you use uh, just uh, human resources for, <laughs> for whatever. So it's clear that it's a lot of work. That, that's why we, are, we, are, we need to be so many and we welcome anyone who wants to join because we need to go through the publication uh, evaluate the quality of the publication. So we do a literature review, uh, but then where we put the knowledge, it's really to the AOP wiki. So this is a platform that I really invite you to visit, which is really all the information is there. It's organized, all key events are described and it's an open access platform that you can uh, easily uh, visit. Okay, a last question. Maybe we have time for this last question from Lucia. Does your research extend beyond COVID? Well, this CHAO project, uh, we focus on COVID. We focus on depicting uh, the disease process of COVID. But of course, as Brigitte mentioned, every key event is, is still stressor specific. So what we described here, the, the information we provide and we summarize and we consolidate for the different key even and key even relationship could be used in other uh, description or, or disease. I will not say a future pandemia because we need to stay optimistic, but even for toxicology, um, that's what we describe could be uh, used in unrelated disease because it's stressor as specific. Okay. Thank you so much, Laura Lixa. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, I think that the session... Uh, can hand here and uh, maybe I can uh, I can pass the <laughs> you can pass the, it to me oh, yeah to Joao yeah thank you thank you Laura thank you to all the speakers it was a really nice session I'm gonna have now a, a short break around seven minutes okay to for you to get up of your chairs have a coffee and start thinking on questions that you want to uh, ask to the next panel but uh, Marcus Strache will um, moderate and be accompanied by Isabel Campos, Marta Moita, Adriana Sanchez Danes, and also Lindsay Marshall and Maurice Willen. So see you in uh, seven minutes sharp, okay? And please come back. It will be a very interesting panel, I'm sure. So good afternoon, everyone. I think we are all here, all the panelists. So can you hear me? Test your mic, please. So we know that you're here to say hello. <laughs> so welcome everyone. So um, welcome to this wonderful and diverse group of experts that we have in here. So even if we are keep saying that model and methods um, can be you know, a way to bridge the different research fields or the different uh, scientists, we must not forget that who built the bridges, it's each of us. Uh, and only the collaboration among people uh, makes this happen. So this is something that is made for people and by people. And this is very, very important that we have a very you know, open discussion. So this is why we have this very nice panel here uh, to understand how this is possible. So to interchange you know, our uh, views of uh, the field, how can this can be really a great progress. Uh, so first of all, I would like to invite anyone in the audience to ask uh, our guest any questions. So please pass your question in the chat. Um, I will look for them. 
So you're really, uh, you know, strongly invited to, to ask the question because this is, you know, the very fundamental of this meeting uh, to interact with the people. And uh, so I would say that the first thing we will do waiting for the question will be, you know, a, uh, a small round the table, tour de table for introducing our host, uh, starting from Isabel. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me to be here. Um, I work in the Champollion Foundation. I was a researcher uh, a while ago. Uh, I was a researcher for 10 years. I first studied embryonic development using the zebrafish embryo as a model system. I then studied wound healing using the drosophila embryo epithelium as a model system. And after that, I turned to uh, support research and I now coordinate uh, animal service platforms at the Champalimo Foundation, in particular, the Drosophila platform and the rodent platform. Uh, I'm also involved in the evaluation of animal experimentation projects in this foundation. And as such, I think I am in a good position to witness what may be the gaps between uh, regulamentation and researchers' needs and, and uh, um, views. And I hope, and that's, that's why I'm interested in this, in this kind of events, um, I hope I could also contribute to build the bridges between these uh, intervenients in the process. Looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. Uh, we follow with Marta. Hello, Marta. Good afternoon. Uh, hi. Uh, uh, like Isabel, uh, I'm, uh, I'm Marta Moita, by the way, and uh, I'm also uh, working at the Champalimo Foundation. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me. Uh, I am a, a biologist by training, and I am a neuroscientist. I've um, started my, uh, my, in my PhD, I did work on how the hippocampus encodes uh, uh, fearful memories, let's say. So how do the representations in hippocampus about space change once that space becomes uh, threatening? And uh, in my uh, lab, I still work on uh, defensive behaviors, how animals interpret danger and how they uh, um, select the appropriate responses. And I started by doing so uh, using rats as a, an organism. And I, a few years ago, I switched to using uh, fruit flies. So now my lab basically studies the organization of defensive behaviors uh, using uh, fruit flies. Yes. And I guess uh, uh, I may be able to contribute a bit to the discussion when I myself have kind of switched model, models. And so it might be interesting. Hopefully I'll contribute something in that regard. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Adriana, please. Good afternoon. And first of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee for the invitation and for having me here today. Uh, I'm a cancer and a stem cell biologist. I'm the area shareholder of the Quanto Cancer Project. And, I, as, and together with Isabel and Marta, I also work in the Limo Foundation. And so I have to say that uh, during, during my scientific career, I have been exposed both to in vitro and in vivo models. So during my PhD, I generated an in vivo, uh, an in vitro model co-culturing basically neurons with astrocytes to, to model Parkinson disease in a Petri dish uh, using induced pluripotent stem cells derived from uh, Parkinson disease patients. And that during my postdoc, I studied the mechanisms that drive the initiation and the resistance to therapy to skin cancer using genetic mouse models. And I recently started my lab here at the Champalimo Foundation. And in, in here, what we do is that we try to understand the mechanisms that drive initiation, progression, metastasis, and res resistance to therapy in cancer. And we try to combine in vitro and in vivo models. So I'm really looking forward to the discussion today. Thank you, Adriana. We follow with Lindsay. Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to echo the thanks, my thanks to the organizers for um, inviting me here today. It, it's quite rare that we get to share this space together. And I think it's incredibly important that we do so and we do so more often. 
So I'm a biomedical science advisor at Humane Society International, which is an animal protection organization. And I've been there for about five years. And my remit within that is to look at opportunities for replacing animals in biomedical research. Prior to working at Humane Society International, I um, had my own research lab and I developed models of the airways with which we were looking at cystic fibrosis and inhalation of e-cigarettes and cigarette smoke, so kind of that toxicity. So um, th that's kind of my model background, but then I'm here very much to think about building bridges and how do we make better science really? So not thinking about animals or non-animals, but just where's the best science come from? Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Anna Olson, please. Thank you. Thank you for the inv invitation and congratulations to the initiative of organizing this, this event. My name is Anna Olson. I'm at the I3S, which is the biggest uh, biomedical research institution in Portugal. We're based in, in Porto in the north of the country. Uh, I'm a scientist. Um, my own research is in animal welfare science and uh, I use primarily behavior but also some uh, veterinary methods to um, investigate the welfare of laboratory mice. My background is as an animal scientist. Uh, I was tra trained uh, to work with farm animals and to study animals in their own right. And that's uh, what I'm still doing. So for my research, the concept of a model, which is you study something to draw uh, conclusions about something else is, is not really part of how I think about my own research. Uh, but because I've been in a biomedical research institution for, for 20 years, and I have a lot of responsibilities that go beyond my own uh, research in terms of teaching and in terms of, of coordinating how we work with, uh, with animals in our institution, I have been forced to think about models. And um, in this, this context, I have been, uh, I have long felt the frustration because I've been attending three hours conferences for about 20 years and uh, seen lots of work on refinement and reduction of the use of laboratory animals for research purposes and lots of work on replacement of toxicity testing and basically nothing that is about models for, for research. So this, this initiative is a little overdue, but very welcome now that it happens. Thank you very much, Anna. And now trying to balancing the gender of this panel. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have to study the hormones of Maurice because he's the only man in the panel. Uh, last but not least, Maurice Whelan, please. Uh, thank you, Marco. It's a great pleasure to be here and join all these wonderful expert ladies. Um, my name is Maurice Whelan. Um, I'm working at the European Commission's Joint Research Centre. <clears throat> I'm head of the Chemical Safety and Alternative Methods Unit there. Um, which incorporates the EU Reference Laboratory for Alternatives to Animal Testing, better known as ECFAM. Um, and I presented yesterday, so I won't bore you again with all of the introducing uh, JRC and ECFAM. Um, I'm actually a bioengineer uh, by training. Um, I used to work in bone mechanics and uh, artificial implants, uh, knee prosthesis. Um, and over the years, I kind of drifted uh, in towards um, the in vitro area uh, where I actually set up a high throughput screening laboratory at the JRC and that kind of led me into the whole world of, of alternatives. Um, at, at ECFAM, um, you know, we've been in the business for over nearly 30 years of supporting um, the three R's. Um, and as Anna said, you know, traditionally the focus has been a lot on regulatory toxicology. Um, in fact, ECFAM over 30 years has looked at over 100 different methods um, and their, their regulatory, uh, potential regulatory applications. So we're very involved in assessment and looking at the validity of models. Um, and, but in more recent years, we've been very much interested in seeing um, how better use of non-animal approaches could be made in the whole area in biomedical research, which is of course, and as you probably already know, over half the animals in Europe are actually used um, in, in, in basic and applied research. Um, and that led us on this path to really try to understand um, how to describe um, models and methods in a way that they could be more applicable in a research domain. 
um, and um, you know that that led us to this um, yeah quest that we're on to see how we can bridge communities and, and get a real model centric discussion going. So thank you. Thank you very much, Maurice. Um, so um, still waiting for questions. So please pass your question in the chat. Uh, I will be reminding you. Um, so as you know, in the history of humanity, many bridges have been built. Um, however, not all resisted the pass of time. And, and maybe, I mean, the only ones that have, you know, survived are the ones with the best technology or uh, that have strategic reason. So these have been maintained. Uh, so now if you would like to, you know, build bridges uh, or virtual bridges, I believe we need to understand the variables that takes, uh, you know, affect our choice of the models and methods that we are using. So uh, starting from Adriana and then moving to Marta, because they are, you know, the bench scientists right now. Uh, can you please tell us the story whether you arrived to the models that you are currently using in your research? So the thing is that in our case, as, as I said before, we are combining both in vivo and in vitro models. And so probably in here, what is important, first of all, is that, so let's, let's think in a scientific perspective. So what we have is a, a question, a scientific question. And then, so basically we have to try to find which is the best method or methodology or approach that would allow us to answer to this question. And so in here, what is important is that as, as scientists, we get the knowledge to know what are the different methods that are available and to also to be able and to be critical and to understand which are the advantages and disadvantages of each method. So in my case, I was extremely lucky because I had the chance to work both in vitro and with in vivo models. And so what we do in the lab is that depending on the question, we are using one or the other. Let me give you just some examples. For example, in the case of, let's say, that metastasis formation. So when, when we want to understand exactly where, so we know that metastasis is this process in which that there's, a, that there's some, some cancer cells that migrate from the tumor from the, the primary tumor sites to other, other organs and sites. And so when we want to address questions related to how the, this metastasis occurs, what we use are in, the in vivo models because they are by far the, the best ones because for now there's no in vitro models that would really, that are able to physiologically mimic what happens in, 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 the, in, the, in the whole body. Or for example, when we want to study the role of the immune system during tumor formation, we are also using genetic mouse models. But for example, when we are interested to understand to really, really quickly analyze and screen for drugs, what we use is that we generate 3D models of our, of our tumor types that we study or organoids or neurospheres. And then this is really quick and fast and also cost efficient. And so we screen for the different drugs and we see what is the effect. And then we can always, in case we want to check if it mimetizes what happens in the physiological conditions, we then can always go back if necessary to the in vivo. So in here, what is really important is to understand what are the advantages and disadvantages of each model. And it's also really important to say that a lot of times what happens is that happened is that when where one model does not arrive, the other arrives. So it, they are a lot of times they are really complementary. And finally, and just to finish, I would like to say that now we are using in vivo and in, in vitro models. But let's say in the in the mid long term, we would like also to add a third arm here. So meaning the in silico models, and especially the I think it's, it would be really important and probably really revolutionary the 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 the, the ones that are. Um, basically especially machine machine learning based. Thank you. So a very uh, specific fit for purpose approach, I would say in your, in your selection. Absolutely, yes. Okay. It would be probably yes, yes, the, yeah. A sentence that would really, yes, summarize what I just said, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Marka? Okay. So uh, I guess uh, I'm, a, I'm a behavioral neuroscientist. So I'm interested in how the brain, um, the, how the brain explains behavior, okay? The, the parts of behavior that can be explained by brain function. And uh, when I started, I wanted to study what I thought were complex behaviors, uh, such as uh, flexibility, spatial navigation, and things like that. So I thought that uh, a good model to study these kinds of complex behaviors would be 
one that would allow us to do uh, manipulations in the brain and still have some, some, some high uh, degree of complexity in the behaviors shown. And that's why I chose to work uh, with rats. Uh, I believe now actually that uh, uh, even rather seemingly simple uh, behaviors like locomotion are actually rather complex and very simple, simple animals can do them from insects to whatever animal. Uh, but at the time that was my thought process, okay? And uh, there was a lot, like the rat at the time was uh, one of the major animal models to study behavioral neuroscience. And there was a, a long tradition from ex experimental psychology. There were a lot of behavioral paradigms and a lot of the brain anatomy was, was well known. So this seemed to be a, a, a good choice. Um, I think in the kinds of works that we do, the when we say uh, the model, what we want to model and the model that we're trying to, to use, I think we're thinking not only about the organism, but also the behavior that you might choose or the set of brain regions that you're interested in. And so then your choice might depend a lot on, on, on these. So for example, I was interested in uh, uh, learning and memory formation. So a good model for that would be one that is a very fast learning that leads to very long lasting memories because we know exactly when the memory was formed and uh, it is long lasting so we can study its process over time. For example, uh, in my lab, I, uh, I thought that one of the things that one might wanna do is to use, to study behaviors that are um, conserved across species for which there is probably um, strong evolutionary pressures and, and, and uh, that's why I study defensive behaviors because the, the behaviors that are shown are similar across all animals ever tested. And so the idea is that if you study one animal, you're gonna probably tap onto generalizable organization principles. Um, and so the idea is that you can, use, you can use mammals, for example, but you can also use uh, fruit flies, which is what I use now. And because they use basically the same categories of behaviors, the way they choose the response is also very similar. The factors that they take into account is also very similar. Then I think that the, probably whatever solution I'll find in the fly will have these same organization principles that are generalizable. So these are the kinds of things that uh, matter to me. The fly, now that I've worked both with flies and the rats, there I can see a number of advantages and disadvantages for one or the other model in studying the same topic. Uh, one of the things that I look at is social behavior. So the social regulation of defensive behaviors and flies, for example, offer a good opportunity for that because we can have large groups of flies while still kept keeping a handle on the, each uh, fly and their neuronal uh, mechanisms. So this is one of the main reasons why I switched to flies is that I can go from a single animal and very detailed mechanistic studies all the way to a collective behavior. Okay, I think I've, I've said enough for now. Thank you very much. And um, so and regarding to this, um, do you think, and this is an open question for all the panelists, there are um, any other variables that are external variables that are influencing uh, the model selection? Um, yes, I mean, you're thinking like when I choose which, which model organism or behavioral task or whatever, what are the constraints in that choice? You mean external constraints? Yes, I mean, this can be, I mean, of course, technological. Uh, yes, I mean, so basically, can... I would say, for example, uh, that one of the reasons why using drosophila to study collective behavior is an advantage is because it's much simpler to uh, uh, keep hundreds of flies, to uh, test in small arenas, uh, large uh, uh, numbers of flies. Technologically, that's important. That's, uh, possible now due to the machine learning uh, uh, technology that allows you to track individuals, for example, so you can have a large number of uh, individuals in a, di in, a, in a dish or whatever, and you can track each individual in the group. So that's what uh, a technological advancement, for example, that is super important for the studies that I do. Maybe if we didn't have that, it would be very difficult to now use Drosophila for these kinds of questions. So it depends, it depends a lot, uh, but uh, indeed, technological, even simple things like housing, expenses, all the uh, uh, life cycle, the length of life cycle. If you're gonna do lots of genetics, maybe the length shorter life cycles is much mm -hmm. easier and so on and so forth. All of these things 
are very important in the choice of a model organism. For example, for me, in my own particular choice to go from rats and uh, go into the fruit fly was also something that maybe in this conversation, uh, it doesn't seem obvious, but your neighbors are also very important, your colleagues. So for example, I chose to work with Drosophila because there's a bunch of uh, groups studying Drosophila in my institution. And so if I was gonna jump into a new model organism, I wanted to be surrounded by experts. And so that's another thing that uh, may constrain the way you choose a model is what is the access to knowledge that you have to, to, to then do it properly, you see? So that's another very important uh, uh, factor, I, I feel. Thank you. Uh, Maurice, would you like to comment? Yeah, I, I mean, I just agree with everything Marta is saying. <laughs> um, she put it very eloquently. Um, what, one, I mean, I, I do think we should talk about those practical um, constraints sometimes. Um, I know Isabel, in her introduction, mentioned that, you know, she's responsible for platforms. So there's obviously big investment in infrastructure in different institutions. And you know, if you're going to do research in that institution, then you obviously make the best use of what infrastructure you have. And, you know, um, I don't think we talk enough about that. And particularly in, in uh, if we talk about in vitro methods, often, um, you know, people say that in vitro methods are cheaper and faster. And of course, we all know that they're not necessarily <laughs> cheaper or faster at all. And particularly as we get into the more complex systems, uh, I mean, I know in our own lab, you know, we, we're culturing for six, eight, ten weeks before we're ready to do an experiment. And <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, for talking about organ on chip, there was a question yesterday in the chat about, you know, are, are there any cheaper ways of getting <laughs> access to the technology? And so I think that's a very important part. And I think what Martha said then to, uh, in support of that is the, the knowledge sharing, um, you know, uh, we all know time is money, you know, in research and uh, as a competitive um, domain. And, you know, you, you can't afford to take a year and a half out to learn something new completely. You know, you, you have to keep going. So you're, you're trying to be productive while you're transitioning also. And that's, that's a major challenge that we don't talk about enough. You know, you can't just drop tools and, and uh, completely shift. Um, and, you know, Marta, I think, just described there how you can do that within an institution that has that support. I think one thing that, uh, as you know well, Marco, in, in, our, um, in our study of uh, these diff seven different disease areas that was presented by you and Laura yesterday, you know, that was a real eye opener for, for us, for me anyway. Um, and it came down to a really simple thing was, if we want to try to transmit this knowledge um, as best we can, what is the optimal way of describing these models? And one thing that we immediately realized, of course, is that the way we had been describing methods linked to toxicological procedures was completely inappropriate way of trying to describe a model which is used for biomedical purpose. And I know it sounds really obvious, but it's only, you know, stupid things like when you start using those templates that we all always had and you think, hang on, this. And then the other thing we realized too is why are we starting with a description of the technology? You know, we're always saying in vitro, in silico, in chemico. And, you know, when we realized this, well, if you're, my analogy is, you know, if I was in uh, Lisbon after the conference at a bar and I met some of you and we were having a chat about our research, um, you tend to, you know, particularly if you're in biomedical research, you tend to talk about the disease area that you're working in, you know, I'm working on cancer, or Alzheimer, or, you know, um, I don't think you'd walk in and go, I use organ on a chip. You know, I mean, that wouldn't be the, the start of the conversation. That would come up a bit later. So we began to realize that what we needed to do is present the knowledge about the different models in a way that would be much more natural, you know, for somebody to engage with, with the, that model. And um, I'd really like us to, to do more of that. I mean, Anna Maria's presentation yesterday was very insightful too, this idea of the source and the target and being more explicit mm -hmm. about what it is, what are the features? And even again, listening to just the introductions there, um, you know, of Adriana, who very, you know, in a short time was able to give insight into what was the, you know, the, the features that were the, 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 the research problem and what made that choice of model, um, you know, the right one, the fit for purpose. And I think we're doing that very implicitly all the time in our work, and we're not doing it explicitly enough, you know, um, and doing it in a more systematic way and telling those stories. And I think, you know, it, it, it's, it's a wonderfully rich way of, of, of give, as I say, giving insight and sharing knowledge. So that'll be just a couple of observations from my side for now, Marco. 
Thank you, Maurice. Anna, would you like to comment? Yes, speaking about infrastructure, um, I would also like to, to reflect on the practical indirect kind of uh, incentives that uh, may be happening, uh, because what I see is it's common to have a central animal facility, which is very well equipped with staff or are highly professional and they will do part of the, the work for you. Um, whereas a lot of the in vitro work will be uh, of the responsibility of the individual lab where this is, where the work takes place. Thank you, Anna. Uh, Lindsay, I see that you raised your hand. Yes, please. Thank you, Marco. So I think I'd like to, I don't know, take a couple of steps back and maybe look at different um, external variables. And that's really thinking about the competition that, uh, you know, and the pressure that researchers are under to get money and to publish. And, and maybe when it comes to um, kind of funding, certainly for my field, when I was um, actively researching, I had very um, narrow remit in that I was looking for non-animal funding. So I was looking specifically at these sorts of opportunities. And I think maybe we need to think about broadening these out as well. So we're not looking for, you know, such a, I don't know, we're not just trying to target three words in a particular grant opportunity, but we're looking more broadly at the, what are these bigger research questions? And, and that sort of feeds into a, um, an issue of language that I think the ELPs and the Chow project is such a beautiful example of how you can start to um, standardize language so that everyone's speaking the same words. I think maybe that's something that we need to start doing as well. So we're, like, we're not talking about this is my model, but we're talking about this is my question or these are my aims or you know, th this is what I want to get out of it. And then, and then the other point feeding on from that, I think is publishing. I think maybe we've got an issue with um, what's accepted and what's required and what do editors look for and what's a good paper. And again, I'm coming from my non-animal standpoint here, but I very much felt that um, a paper was better if it had in vivo data because you get the advantages that Adriana's told us about, that you get that kind of the systemic response and maybe it's a bit more organismal, but it's not always appropriate. So um, in terms of educating grant reviewers and publication reviewers, it's not just about it, it, what is that model and what is it trying to do, but it's much more about a bigger picture sort of thing. I don't have any answers, but that's just, I think, something else to throw into the mix. Yes, thank you. Um, so before going back to Anna, that she's raising her hands, I would like to know, you know, the opinion from uh, a management point of view of the science. Uh, Isabel, what do you think, especially when the variables are, for example, access to platform, access to uh, knowledge sharing or other experts, what is your point of view? Well, I actually think that external factors uh, have a very big uh, uh, weight on the decision of the model. That's that's what I see definitely also uh, because, uh, I mean, uh, most research is actually done not by principal investigators, but, but by their students and postdocs. And it's uh, probably, um, or it has probably not been up until you're uh, uh, at in an independent uh, point of your research career that you start really thinking about uh, the best model. Up until then, most probably, you're using the model that you were trained to use. I, you cannot be trained in a multitude of models. So uh, tradition and expertise of your uh, mentors and, and uh, access to facilities, uh, they all play. Um, a very important role on the choice of the model uh, up to the point that that choice is not thought uh, and and conscience conscient i think uh, that's that's what i witness um so i think i think it's important uh, that these things are um discussed from the very beginning of uh, the scientist um, uh, formation and training because uh, 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 just like that, um, will you be able to actually make um, a conscious decision uh, early on? Yeah, thank you. Actually, also from the audience, we have that, you know, the, the variable, uh, the tradition variable, it's something that has to be taken into account because that's, that's of course, is also, you know, a, 
a restraint, a constraint of what we are, uh, you know, uh, in residence of the model that we have. And this is important to address, but um, we also have the opportunity that can be offered by the structure where we work to expand our, you know, our uh, horizon. So Anna, please, if you would like to, um, you're muted, you're muted. No. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Um, following up first on, on what Isabel said, uh, absolutely. And uh, I would love to know that PhD students are being coached by their supervisors to think about why a certain model is being used, rather than uh, simply being told that this is the, the, the model that we are using. Uh, following up on what Lindsay said, um, I'm going to go out on a limb here and be political uh, because before we have model choice, we have to have model development. Uh, we know that from toxicity. I don't know how many million euros have been spent on replacement in toxicity, but when I reviewed uh, the, um, the, the, the number of projects up until FP7, it was somewhere between 25 and 30. And some of them have been huge projects. And it's about time that we get some of this for, for models in biomedical research. Thank you, Anne. Uh, we, I, I believe that we have a lot of funding that toxicity because this is something that was you know, very urgent. But I, I'm also, I mean, I'm a biomedical scientist by training. And I also believe that uh, we were not really, a, um, I would say, um, conscious that there was an alternative movement because as Adriana has witnessed, I mean, we were using stem cell and in vitro model and in silico model just to address any you know, uh, disease question. And I even didn't know anything that was, you know, the three R's and anything because it just fit for the purpose. So this is also something that we have to take into account that we have also to promote a little bit more this uh, flow of conscience into the biomedical community. And I believe that the work that uh, that the jersey is doing right now in the biomedical field, it's also uh, to address this part. So uh, we have uh, the first question from the public. Uh, so I will shoot it to you, which is what known animal model were you more surprised to discover? That's the first question from Ruben. And then we have, do you think we will be able to sometime fully substitute the use of animal models in biomedical research? Uh, I believe that the first question is easier to answer. So please, um, Marta. Uh, being the, the first question, what non-animal model? You were more surprised? surprised to discover. In my career, like whatever, throughout. Yeah, the... but it, yeah. Uh... Or the... It's, that's a difficult, I always, every time I'm asked what's the most, I always have a very, very hard time, whatever is, what's the, you know, the best cake, the best movie, or the best uh, non-animal movie, I, I, I just, I just get stuck. So I'm probably not the best person to answer this question. I would say, uh, from the perspective of behavior, I would say currently that, uh, um, Deep, deep networks are going to probably change the way we think about behavior in the brain, okay? Uh, because of what they, they allow us to do. I'm not sure they will right now uh, by themselves and uh, make us understand how the brain works because we don't really understand what's going on in the deep networks, to my understanding. So, so it's not, it's, it's unclear, but as a tool, at least it will uh, allow us to make a lot of progress. And I guess uh, there's amazing things with robotics also. They're, they're really quite amazing, but it's not something that I had never heard of. And all of a sudden it's like, wow, this exists, you know? So nothing like that currently comes to mind that there was something that I had no idea could possibly exist outside an animal. I'm sorry, I, it's, it's not the most inspiring answer, but at the moment I can keep a very good one. Any other? I think the most, yes. exci the most exciting, I remember years ago when we got a microelectrode array um, platform in our lab and was able to um, culture, um, actually use pretty potent stem cell derived neuronal cultures and see 
the electric, like all the electrophysiological activity um, in vitro. That I remember it was many, many years ago now. And uh, we, sh it was a time when we used to actually fabricate our own microelectrode array chips in the nano lab next door. Um, so it was quite a laborious thing to do, but um, really to see that electrophysiology in vitro and, and, and to be able to acquire so much data of a totally different data type. Now it's commonplace. You can get multi well plate electrophysiological measurement systems, no problem with that. That was probably my memory of the most exciting thing we had in the lab that made a big impression on me. Thank you. Lindsay? Okay, so um, I'm not going to say that this was a surprise. I'm going to say it was more of a delight. And that's um, coming from my respiratory background. That was the breathing lung on a chip that just showed that you can recreate that huge complexity of, you know, rib cage coming in and out, all the intercostal muscles and, and, and the diaphragm moving up and down. And you can reduce all of that to stick it onto a chip with a couple of chambers and stretch it a little bit. And that stretching makes a huge functional difference. I think that's hugely exciting. And I think the fact that it's developed from there as well, that it's not just about one monoculture, but it's also about um, putting in the core cultures there. So you've got the right interaction between different cell types and then you can put blood in the bottom and air across the top. So I think as much as we know about the complexity of animals, we can start to recreate parts of that. And I think that's hugely important because then we can start to build back up again if we need to. And it's all about being fit for purpose. So it, it's really, I think, my surprise is how much we can do and how clever people are out there that are in the labs doing all of this. I think that's pretty wonderful. Thank you. Yes, Adriana. So for me, more than, uh, let's say, a model, I would say a technology that it was really exciting. It was the discovery of the induced pluripotent stem cells that Yamanaka won the, the Nobel Prize for this. And so basically it opened, let's say, a, a really brand new, let's say, world to investigate and to model human diseases and basically using cells that were from human patients that had not only the genetic, the epigen the genome, but also the epigenome that was present in, in, in within this, these patients that had the disease. And so then if you combine these with the 3D models like the organoids, I think this is extremely powerful to try to understand first the human disease as well as to treat them. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um... So I will shoot you another question because I believe the second one. So how, how, how do you build trust in a model? So how do you make others trust your data by trusting your models? Anyone? Yes, Martha. So I guess, uh... I can tell you a little bit about my experience with moving into the Drosophila, that we started by trying to, uh, that was not really our intent at the beginning, but uh, serendipitously, we, we just found that flies, just as a, a vertebrates uh, freeze in response to an inescapable threat. And that led us sort of down the road of trying to see what other things we have in common in Drosophila and the vertebrate species in terms of their defense mechanisms. And uh, one of those attempts has been to look at the uh, cardiac activity of the fly and see how the cardiac activity of the fly is um, regulated by the presence of a threat. And uh, there, uh, there were some studies already with a, the with a, a cardiac activity of Drosophila, but not in behaving flies. And so we had to develop a new method, method to image the, the cardiac activity of the awake behaving fly. And uh, there, I guess what you, what I felt, it's always difficult at the beginning because you all, you're always doubting yourself and you always suffer from the imposter syndrome. And I, I, and I still suffer a bit from that, but I feel that the, most of the time what you're doing is not completely new, okay? Some people in some other animal or some other model has done something more or less similar. So you try to find, what are these uh, things that you can use as a ground truth to your own work, okay? So this has been shown before, this particular part of it, if I replicate that particular part, I can at least trust that that I'm doing right. And then you can start building upon that. So that's one important thing, at least for me. Another one is to try to, to validate it with things like, uh, you know, if I do this certain manipulation, this is what should happen and uh, stuff like that. Ideally, if you have multiple, uh, methods that you can use 
to come to the same conclusion, that's also ideal, right? Because then you have convergence evidence that uh, what you're do doing uh, is right and makes sense. So I think is a lot about that, to have a convergent set of evidence uh, and use prior knowledge. There's always some prior knowledge normally uh, that you can uh, ground your work on. Um, at least that's, that's how I approach it. Thank you, Marta. Maurice? Okay, sorry, I think I was blocked there. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's funny. I, it, um, for years, uh, my own, a lot of my own work with Vectra has been looking at things like, like what Marta's just touched on there, how to systematically um, you know, establish the credibility and validity of models. And that's what I presented yesterday. And Marta mentioned there one of the credibility factors, which is this external concordance. Can you, can you compare with orthogonal? Uh, but you know what? In recent years, as much as I do think that's important and we do need a, a harmonized framework to establish the scientific evidence supporting model validity, I've come, I've come to a conclusion, particularly working in, with Sophia on, on her project, which is about not sharing knowledge on models and methods, and working with Anna Maria as well and others. We, I think we underestimate the whole social dimension of, of this. I think the trust... Um, really I've seen in the, in the models that make it, and particularly in the regulatory toxicological area, are not the best models. They're just the ones that people are the most familiar with, that have had the most chance to talk about. Um, and then so that whole co-creative collaborative process, and I think Michelot's presentation really caught my attention today, was it, it was, it was a, as I, uh, if I understood correctly from your presentation, Nicola, was, was, was it was a collaborative effort to design and, and uh, you know, this experiment that everybody had a stake in. So I think it gets to a point where it's not about if that's the best experiment or how ultimately valid the experiment is from a scientific perspective, because ultimately that's a subjective assessment. You know, fitness for purpose sounds great. We all say it, but it's a subjective judgment at the end of the day. Um, what makes it special and trustworthy for the community that's engaged in that is the fact that you did it together. And I think that's been a bit of an eye opener for us. Uh, and again, forgive me if sounding so naive, naive if, if a sociologist or <laughs> philosophers would say, a bit, you know, but, but you know, uh, I think that's a, that's a path we'd like to travel down uh, at, at ECFAM in the next years is that still keep looking at the scientific um, values, the scientific properties, attributes, factors, but in equally also, how do we create the right ecosystem, the right environment to be able to build trust through the, through dialogue? And I mean, that's why this workshop has been so important for us to, as an almost experimental, you know, um, thing. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Maurice. So we're, well, we are already passing uh, our time, but um, Anna has her hands raised. So please, these will be also the final <laughs> comment. So a great responsibility. Uh, <laughs> so I, I better make it a good one. I wanted to follow up with what Maurice said. I, I think absolutely the social aspect has uh, plays an enormous role. Um, but I would also like to argue that a model that is 75% of the ideal, if you assume that there is another one, which is 95%, if you have a large community working with a 75%, valid model that may actually be better for science and have a larger impact than if you have only one or two groups working with a 95% model. Thank you. So I believe we are already uh, completely on time, uh, maybe two minutes late. Um, any final comment from any of you? Yes, Lindsay. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that I think um, absolutely, Morris, that it, it, it's more about talking and science in the past has relied on publications. And I think we're all realising that publications are often not quite what they seem. It's not all black and white, what you see in front of you. And actually, yes, working together and talking with each other and having these sorts of discussions are, are, are hugely important. But also, how can we learn from best practice as well of, of, of um, um, Nico's project with the, the IBL and the Chow project? And they seem to be really fantastic examples of bringing communities together and sharing and, and being trustworthy with each other. So 
I think moving forward, it's a question of how do we build on that and how do we use those examples and spread them out a bit more widely and, and um, kind of develop that as a framework for science rather than relying on the kind of publications. Thank you, Lindsay. Okay. Well, I believe, um, especially in collaboration, I believe that's the only way to, uh, you know, to build the bridges and also to talk between the different fields. Marta, very quick. Comment before finish. I have the just very quick comment, which is I feel that the collaborations are super important, but oftentimes from a funding perspective, they rely on large networks. And I actually think that the the at least for me as a scientist, the most fruitful collaborations are those that involve smaller groups where you actually interact in a meaningful way a lot rather than being inserted in a big network. And you may actually not really communicate a lot in that network. So maybe there's some nodes in the network that communicate, but then there's lots of elements that don't. So I'm just putting out there as a thought that uh, maybe an emphasis on smaller collaborations can be very useful and that uh, you know large networks might not necessarily increase social interactions, which is what I think we're really talking about here, these dialogues. Anyways, that's... Yeah, I agree. Uh, we need smaller group, but also very multidisciplinary, you know, we're very different uh, partners of view because that will be the enriching one. So I would like to thank you, um, each of you, for, uh, you know, joining our panel. And I would like now pass the word to Sophia and Joao for, uh, you know, the closure. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Mark and all the, the panelists. Uh, I think this was a great way to, to finalize our finalize our meeting, establishing some more bridges. I couldn't help notice that one of the participants uh, in these small Zoom squares has actually a bridge painted behind him. I'm not sure if it was on purpose or not, but we really appreciate that. Uh, but maybe, Sophia, we could go like, do a quick overall um, Sorry, I think Jose. Okay, <laughs> maybe we can do a quick overall um, view on the on the event before we close it. Okay, just because you know Portugal uh, will play in a bit, and uh, maybe people want to finish at time for once. Yes, yeah, I think I think it was an amazing. Uh, meeting, I might be biased, but uh, I'm really happy with what we conquered here all together, all these uh, amazing uh, people, participants, speakers, panelists, this uh, ecosystem, as you referred at, at the beginning of, of our meeting. And um, I dare to say this is not the end of the meeting, it's maybe the, the starting of something and to start of new collaborations, and we would be very happy to know that. So. Yeah, just a, a, like a, a quick overview. We, we, we had this two days meeting. We started with the talk of Maurice explaining a bit what the commission is doing, especially the ECVAM is doing uh, in this respect. And um, I think we are already doing some bridges in between different models and, and uh, we are open to do even more bridges. And then we, we started um, an, the session then we had the session A. Do you want to comment on that, Joe? Yeah, for me, it was a very surprising session, although I was on the organization also. But I uh, heard from Lucia, from Benjamin, and also from Laura and Marco uh, about what they've done recently on ECVAM. All, all, their, all their input was extremely interesting and, uh, and really bridged a lot of topics in a lot of ways to, to approach uh, research areas. And uh, uh, I can then Ana Maria with their philosophy approach and the, the challenge that uh, she put everyone up to. And it was not an easy one, as you could see, thanks to the, the Zoom limitations, because if this was as we, as we initially imagined, it would be a physical event and now it would be time for a beer or something like that. And we could uh, join together and uh, chat and network, but this was what we could do. And still we had amazing results, don't you think, Sophia? Yes. Um, I think it was a really challenging 
thing as you as you mentioned and and we are sorry as Anna Maria said for all the trouble we had to play a bit with the uncertainties of these online meetings but we were really happy with what we managed to bridge and and the success of of this exercise uh, it's recorded in Sirenia's uh, sketch which we really like it and um, we we will share it with you. Uh, so I think it was a great way to, to finalize the day of yesterday and to, to open today as well uh, before the, the session that Laura Gribaldo shared. Yeah, which was uh, also very, very impressive. In some way about the, the number of uh, inputs that you can take from with no single experiment, the, num the amount of data that you can take, and then how can you share that data and how can you make it available uh, elsewhere? This And then the the AOP, all, all, which is like an amazing way, which I'm certainly takes a lot of effort to implement, but it can produce results taking advantage of the know-how that is so many times scattered around, right? Yes, I think I like that session because often it's said that um, researchers are very protective with what they uh, do. And here there were several different examples on how you can share your data and your knowledge and, and achieve great things. And then I think we, we finished on the best way with this panel discussion on the different methods and models with people with very different backgrounds that didn't know each other before. And I think this is really, really valuable. Um, so for the ones that had missed some parts of the meeting, the meeting has been recorded as you have seen and it will be available um, online at some point, not immediately because there is some editing uh, being done. And, uh, and, and I'll, yes, please do. Yeah, I'd like also to say that a very good part of the discussion was uh, in the chat box. Actually, it was really nice to see how people participate and engaged. And I believe also in the breakout groups, although we only went there occasionally, but I think there was a real network there. Yes, that was probably the real bridging of this meeting, right? That we managed to have it even if it was online and without a drink in hand. Um, <laughs> But uh, uh, Laura, could you share the 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 slide, the results of the slide of yesterday? So this is what you replied, and on what um, you would expect from this meeting. Uh, and now we wanted to challenge you again for a, a new slide. So if I may um, share my screen um, about it's it's the same hashtag in the same website, and we want to know. I hope you see it. So we want to know what do you take home from this meeting? Oh, and we were all missing the square from Oh, the... sorry, yes. <laughs> Mission accomplished. I, I like this. <laughs> I'm reading in the in the chat box that Lindsay is saying that let's walk the talk, which is very important. But, uh, in fact, yeah. So our mission was pretty much that to try to put people in communication. Now it's a bit up to you also. <laughs> yes, the the idea is this is the start of something, not really just a meeting and something that can be continued, reproduced. Maybe other people want to organize a follow up of this meeting. I would be happy to attend. So bridges, connections, network, cooperation. Uh, so it seems that we managed to accomplish some of the expectations that the participants yeah. had at the beginning. Nico saying that it would be nice to have an online platform to keep in touch. We created a LinkedIn group. Uh, I don't know if you want to start a Facebook group also, Nico. I wouldn't say that would be your piece of resistance, but. I think everyone got the, the, the invitation for the, the LinkedIn group, but I think we can share it again here in the chat box. So I think that's the easiest way to, to get in touch. 
Yes, and there will be an email follow up of the meeting for the people that would need some certificates or want to have a certificate of the meeting with just a short questionnaire. We can also put the link uh, of the LinkedIn group there so we can uh, continue the discussion. So I think we have a very nice wall uh, to, to finalize in terms of what people managed to have from this meeting. We might have another wall, and I'm, I'm blinking the eye to Sirene. I don't know if she has something to show us. Um, yeah, we should thank Sirene for all her work, not only doing these amazing drawings, but also pretty much managing social media also. Yes, in fact, she was a great help. Sirene, do you want to share your screen? Maybe it's the best way. She will do it. Oh. Let's just play suspense. The beat, then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can you can already start guessing what she has to share with us. You can put yeah. it in, in the chat box. Like uh, what are your bets? You can also bet what would be the result of the match up. Hi. Hello. Uh, so it this was super challenging because every intervention was precious. So I tried to do my best to capture some things, but it was really, really tough to select, you know, but it was very fast to do. Uh, let's see if I managed to share you my screen. It's coming. It seems. A slow bridge, traffic, so <laughs> yes. Okay, do you see it? We no. see your screen. Uh -huh. Oh, yes. Oh, oh, it's gone. <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> but you see the iPad or the computer one? I think it was we the iPad. Seeing. You saw the drawing, right? Okay. We uh, saw the drawing. Yes. I'm going to try again. Sorry, it's the stress of the moment. <laughs> I will anyway post it uh, soon and I will send you send it to you so you can send it to every participant if you want. Thank you. Uh, there we go. Yes, it's coming. Here it is. Our panel discussion uh, with Isabel Campos, Maurice, Willen, Marta, Moita, Marco Stracci, Adriana Sanchez Danes, and Holson and Lindsay Marshall. I, I hope that we will like what you see and uh, what it was captured here. Totally COVID uh, captured for sure. Thanks yeah. to Isabel. Um, it will be updated um, soon. Yeah. <laughs> well, but we will always know when this meeting was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So just uh, need some final touch and be ready. Hope you like it. I try to, I really enjoyed the whole meeting. I learned a lot about this field that of, of course is not my expertise, but, uh, I, I enjoyed it a lot, so I take advantage of this to thank to the organizer for counting on me and uh, all the participants. It was really, really great and very rewarding for me. And I hope uh, uh, you enjoyed uh, as much as I did. <laughs> uh, I did. <clears throat> it's I really great. did. And I think it's the best way to closure. Yeah. And uh, we, had, we had some uh, speakers asking if they could have the... Um, their, their cartoon. Yeah, sure. Yeah, they will. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> In due time. <laughs> so thank you so much, everyone that joined us, all the participants, all the interactions that we had. Thanks to all the speakers. Thanks for ECVAM to 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 take on this challenge with uh, with us at Congent and Champalimo. Uh, and uh, thanks for all the organization that was a bit more behind the scenes. You didn't notice them but they were precious to to make all this happen uh, people from freshy from uh Moore foundation and uh, of course ECFAM. am i missing something sofia no no jean i, I also we are from ECFAM. we also want to thank you uh Champagne Moore and freshy and uh, all the the co-organizing all the speakers all the panelists and everyone that joined today and uh, I think you have your, our contact. So 
uh, both from 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 all the the organizing team. If there is something that uh, some information you need or something you like to propose, uh, please do it. Yeah, uh, for the Portugal. No, let's go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, everyone. Thank you for inviting us. Ciao, ciao. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye.